Glimmer of Christmas, written by Heather Harris, narrated by Elise Gibbs. Chapter 1 Byron Trent was suspended from the ceiling, and he was looking very happy about it. His little soldier was standing to attention amongst the multitude of ropes that covered his body. Byron was a rope bunny, someone who liked getting tied up. His wife Beth was well aware of his love of bondage, but lately she began to suspect that she wasn't the only one meeting his needs. She'd hired me to do some digging. The case had almost been too simple to solve, but as a PI setting up shop in a new city, I was happy to make some easy money. Byron Trent was a very busy CEO of an FTSE 500 company, and his job was stressful. He enjoyed letting someone else take the reins now and again so to speak. Beth Trent had been more than happy to step into that role, but recently he'd come home with what she was certain were rope marks that she hadn't inflected. I followed him on his lunch hour and he'd gone straight to a shibari dojo. Shibari is a Japanese art of tying people up into pretty patterns, and when I saw him, Byron looked like a work of art. His rigger, a small Japanese lady who looks as if she couldn't possibly hoist him into the air, I had used a system of pulleys to haul him up. It wasn't my jam, but Byron looked like he'd almost reached a state of bliss. I was spying through a very small gap in the dojo's shutters. The place was in a basement building, and I was lying on the cold, wet ground, spying through a grate. Gatto sat on his haunches next to me, patiently waiting for me to do my thing. Normally I did my best to get a picture or two for my clients, but the angles were all wrong. On this occasion, my evidence would be a bit lacking. That was unusual for me, but I was off my game just now. My best friend Lucy was sick, and I hated leaving her. I think I might have been coddling her just a little too much, because that morning she'd virtually shoved me out of the house when Mrs. Trent called. Even as I explained that the job was all the way up in Liverpool, Lucy was shoving me into the car with a thermos and flask of tea. I wasn't a bad P.I., so I could see that Lucy desperately needed some space to deal with all the stuff going on in her life. But it was hard to let her deal with it alone. I'd been alone, so I knew what it was like, and it was not always the best place to be. Lucy knew that she was sick, but not the wise and hows. She didn't know about the magical other realm and had no idea that she was dying because of that absolute idiot, James. Instead, she believed she had a rare degenerative illness. Lucy was adopted when she was three, and her records were sealed, so she didn't know who her birth parents were or what their medical history might be. She thought that she'd inherited something awful from them. I knew the truth, of course, but if I told her, then I'd have breached the verdict, which kept the other realm hidden from the common realm, and who knew what the punishment for that would be? Death? Maiming? Either way, it wasn't something I was going to mess about with willy-nilly. After half an hour, Mr. Trent was carefully lowered down and gently untied. His rigger passed him a bottle of water and covered him with a blanket whilst he slowly came to. After a few moments, he stretched out his feet, gave her a blissful smile, and stood up, naked and unabashed. He was totally relaxed now, in more ways than one. He finished his water, dressed in his impeccable suit, gave his rigger a bow and strolled out, ready for his 2pm board meeting. Gatto and I followed him safely back to his office. I usually prefer to give my clients photographic evidence that I delivered personally, but with my worries about Lucy pressing down on me, I skipped the evidence in the face-to-face -face meeting and called Beth with the news instead. Mrs. Trent, speaking. It's Jinx. Is there a problem? she asked, assuming that I hadn't managed to find her husband. No, no problem. He was at the office, and I followed him on his lunch break. And? she asked, her tone resigned. He went to a shibari dojo in the city centre. He was tied up by a rope rigger, suspended, and then lowered down. He got dressed and left. Nothing sexual happened. She snorted. Huh. He will have gotten hard during all that. She sighed. Well, I wish he'd spoken to me about this. I've always said no to Shibari because I'm frightened he'll get injured. Once you factor in gravity, there are rope burns and ligament injuries and all sorts to worry about. The dojo he went to has professional Shibari riggers, I explained. No doubt. She sighed again. 
Looks like I'm learning Shibari as a Christmas present for him. I expect there's a course I can go on. Thanks, Jinx. Send me your invoice. Add a bonus for getting it done so quickly. No need, I assured her. I'll only charge for my time. All too meagre hours of it. I couldn't justify including my travel time when my business was supposed to be situated in Liverpool. It wasn't her fault that I'd been down in the home counties when I received her call. I reconfirmed her email address and rang off. It was always nice when the dirt that you uncovered was only a muddy puddle that could dry up fairly quickly. Like she said, Beth Trent was learning shibari. Christmas was only two days away, and Liverpool City Centre was bustling with last-minute shoppers. Christmas market stalls lined the street in little wooden huts decorated with twinkling lights. I was in the other realm, so the sky was a beautiful shade of lilac that looked stunning against the shining fairy lights. Lying on the cold, wet streets had chilled me to the bone, so I indulged myself by grabbing a hot chocolate with cream and marshmallows, which I sipped as Gatto and I strolled through the market. Friends were sitting out wrapped up in coats and scarves and hats, warmed by heat lamps and glasses of mulled wine. The tantalising scents drifted on the chilly breeze, making me wish I'd grab booze instead of a hot chocolate, but technically I was still on the clock, so it was best to stick to the non-alcoholic option. On a whim, I bought a gingerbread man. I'd eat him later. Gatto gave a whine and nudged me firmly. What? I asked. He nudged me again, and I grinned. You want a sausage? He tapped his tail twice in the affirmative. Sure thing. I gave his head a rub, and walked to the German market, where sausage and sauerkraut were on offer. I bought his two hot dogs, splashing mine liberally with tomato ketchup and mustard, but keeping his plain. He wolfed it down in two big gulps. I glared a bit. Well, at least pretend to savour it, I complained. He grinned, doggy tongue lolling out, unrepentant, then looked at me hopefully. I sighed. Fine. Can I get another plain hot dog, please? I asked the vendor. Sure thing. He grinned at me. That's not a dog, it's a horse. I resisted the urge to groan. If I had had a pound for every time someone had said that to me, I would have been a millionaire. Okay, well, maybe not a millionaire, but definitely a thousandaire. You could put a saddle on and ride him, the vendor quipped, as he passed me the extra hot dog. I smiled patiently. Thanks. I took the food and ignored his comments. If Gatto had been an ordinary Great Dane, then riding him would not have been a good idea, despite the multitude of people who suggested it, each of them thinking they were being hilarious and original. But in truth, Gatto is a hellhound, and when he is in his hellhound form, he is the size of a small pony. So, yes, I could ride him if I really wanted to, but no, he still wasn't a horse. I put the gingerbread man in my bum bag for later. Bellies pleasantly full, we made our way back to our office. The space had been generously rented out to us by Lord Valderus, the local vampire leader, because I'd saved his undead son's life. That had left me somewhat bonded to Nate, which was awkward for us both, but we settled on working towards some sort of friendship. Nate had spent a few weeks in America, stretching the bond between us to see if it would fade with distance, it did not, if anything, it left me with an uncomfortable itch where he should have been. I was relieved to have him on the same patch of land once again. Verona was manning the office. She was a stunningly beautiful vampire, they all were, but for some reason she had a real chip on her shoulder when it came to me. I wasn't her favourite person. Well, that was fine. She wasn't mine either. She scowled as I entered. You have clients. I blinked. I did? The day had gone from empty to full very fast. They've been waiting, Verona continued, admiring her nails. For how long? About an hour. I glared. And it didn't occur to you to call me. I did. Your phone had no signal. Lie. As I was a truth seeker, lying to my face was a dumb idea. However, most of the other community thought I was a wizard and an empath and didn't know the full extent of my powers. And if I didn't want to be kidnapped and put to nefarious purposes, I needed to keep it that way. I pulled up the call register on my phone and turned it towards her. You're lying. No missed calls. Do it again and I'll report you to Lord Valderus. 
I'll tell the teacher on you wasn't my favourite threat, but punching a vampire was probably a really bad idea. Verona glared back and bared her very sharp teeth. Do we understand each other? I pressed. You're speaking English, aren't you? She spat. You know, you're a terrible secretary. You take that back. I'm an excellent secretary. And yet you didn't ring me, I pointed out snarkily. Whatever, your client is waiting. She was right. Gatto growled at her for good measure, then we went to our office. I walked through the anteroom where my sometimes assistant Hester sat. Today the desk was empty because she had lectures. I suspected her absence might also have had something to do with Nate's presence. Not too long ago they'd been a thing. Then Hess was kidnapped. Now they weren't a thing, but I suspected one day they'd be a thing again. Mostly because I could sense Nate's feelings about Hess and they were full of roses and doves. I walked into the office and there, sitting impatiently at my desk, was Amber Delia. She was the last person I'd expected to ask me for help because help wasn't in her vocabulary. But as I stepped towards my desk, I saw that she wasn't alone. Chapter 2 Amber Delia was a witch, a slightly scary witch with sumptuous long red hair and pale skin. She was always dressed in boho chic. Today I spied a long blue embroidered skirt peeping out from beneath a full-length coat. Her expression was supercilious, like she could smell something rotting in the air. Amber was a powerful woman, and I had come to respect her. I liked her too, though I wasn't sure that feeling was reciprocated. She had healed my leg after it had been somewhat mauled by a horde of unicorns, but her ministrations had come with a hefty invoice which my friend Wilf had paid. He could afford it, so I didn't lose any sleep. He was one wealthy werewolf. Sitting next to Amber with her hands folded primly in her lap was a little girl. She was about six or seven years old, if that. She had red hair, same as Amber, but hers was in tight ringlets. She'd been crying and her eyes were red-rimmed. My heart gave a twist. Bar their hair colour, there was no resemblance between Amber and the girl. Not her daughter, then. A niece, perhaps? Amber, I greeted her. I'm sorry you kept waiting. I wasn't informed that you were here. She pressed her lips together, no doubt to prevent herself from biting out that she'd invoiced me for her time. But she was here for my help, for once. What can I do for you? I asked. Her expression grew a bit rueful, and she gestured for the girl to explain. I've lost my Christmas sack, the child said sadly, and I can't find it anywhere. Your Christmas sack? I parroted blankly. Mostly, I was hired to follow cheating spouses, sometimes find missing people, and very occasionally to investigate a death. Christmas sacks weren't really in my repertoire, and six-year-olds weren't usually my clients. It's like a Christmas stocking, but it's bigger, she explained. How will I get any presents from Santa without my sack? Her voice wobbled on the edge of tears. Jade, I promise Santa will find another sack. Amber explained patiently, her tone indicating it was something she'd said many times already. No, he won't! He can't! It has to be this sack! Jade burst into tears. Gatto stood up from his bed and went over to her. She didn't bat an eyelid at a huge hellhound padding towards her. Instead, she slid out of her chair and wrapped her little arms around his thick neck. He hooked his great head over her shoulder to give her his best cuddle. Thanks. I mount to my dog. He gently growled the little girl to join him on his bed. When he lay down, she snuggled next to him, still crying her heart out. After a few moments, the crying stopped, and her chest rose and fell rhythmically. Is she asleep? I asked Amber softly. I think so, she whispered back. I know this is ridiculous, she huffed, but I need you to find that sack. Jade lost her parents in a car crash about six months ago. Her mum and dad were part of the coven here in Liverpool, so we've formally taken her in. Josh and Emma left a will with some of the other witches listed as her guardians, so the authorities have placed her with us. Any evidence of foul play? No, it's just a drunk driver. Nothing other about it. Sometimes a crash is just a crash. True. Yeah. Poor Jade. 
I murmured. Amber looked tired. Her mum made her that sack, stitched it by hand. All of Jade's stuff from her last home is in her new room at the coven, but not that. I've torn the place apart looking for it, but I can't find the darn thing. So you're hiring a private eye to find it? Amber, you do have a heart, I teased. She glared at me. Don't bandy it about. Will you find it or not? I looked at the skinny girl, curled up next to my hellhound. I'll do my darndest. Has she been introduced to the other already? The other was a magical realm that coexisted alongside the common one. I likened it to putting on glasses. You went through a portal into the other, like putting on a pair of specs. And suddenly you could see. Only instead of sharpened visual acuity, you could see fire elementals and dryads and dragons. The problem with the portal was that once you started going through it, you couldn't stop. You had to constantly ferry between the two realms, charging your magical batteries in the common realm ready for use in the other. Most people saw the downtime in the common realm as a nuisance, but I enjoyed seeing blue skies and green grass, rather than the lilac skies and turquoise grass in the other. The common still felt like home, even if it made me more vulnerable. Of course she has, she's been raised coven bound. Didn't you listen to what I just said? I shrugged. I've only been introduced to the other for a few weeks. Amber's glare lessened. Right, of course. So she's in common now. I was in the other. Everyone else in the other could tell that by the triangle tattoo on my forehead. The girl in front of me had no tattoo, which meant she was in the common realm. Yes, I'll take her back to the hall shortly. The hall housed the magic portal that let you hop between realms. You can use Gatto if you like, I offered. Because Gatto was a hellhound, he was brilliant in the battle, and in his downtime he could manipulate the realms like a master. He could send anyone to any of the realms. That was one of the reasons hellhounds were so rare and so sought after. That and the fact that their bodies made some fine potion ingredients. Thank you, that would be helpful, Amber said grudgingly. Have you got a picture of the sack? There was a question I'd never thought I'd ask. Amber pulled her phone out of her coat pocket and passed it to me. On the screen was a picture of Jade with two people who were obviously her parents. They were standing in a cuddle huddle in front of a Christmas tree that had clearly been decorated by a child. Clashing tinsel and homemade decorations hung on every branch. Kids didn't understand that less was more. In the photo, Jade was beaming her happiness radiating out of the picture. Behind her was a small pile of presents, and next to her was the sack. It was a hessian affair, lined with tartan fabric, and across its breadth read Special Delivery for Jade Melia from Father Christmas. The words had clearly been written on carefully. It was something her parents had made with love, and it made my heart ache. I'd never had a sack, each night, on Christmas Eve, I would rifle through the airing cupboard and pick out a pillowcase. I'd always gone for one of the special ones, with lace or flowers. I had adored hanging it on my door handle, full of excitement about what the morning would bring. Even as the years passed and I learnt the truth about Santa, the excitement remained. I hadn't hung a pillowcase for seven years. There was no one to surprise me with a sack full of gifts. No socks or shower gel or chocolate oranges for me. Until then, I hadn't realised how much I had missed it. Jade was too young to lose that feeling of anticipation. She'd lost her parents at an atrociously young age. But I was going to find that darned sack if it was the last thing I did. Chapter 3 Jade snoozed on, cuddled into Gatto's warmth. My hellhound was magic in more ways than one. He was wrapped around her protectively, keeping her safe, while she was at her most vulnerable. "'What can you tell me about the other coven kids?' I asked. "'You think someone was playing a prank?' "'You don't?' "'I'm not sure,' Amber said finally. "'I pulled in all the other children and told them that if it turned up, no punishment would be levelled, but it's still missing. "'How popular is Jade with the others?' She sighed. "'She's a loner, by all accounts.' I haven't seen that much of her. I've been busy at the home county's coven. 
I'll be spending more time here, so I'm going to put more support in place for Jade. Will the coven boss here resent that? The coven mother, she corrected. She'll still be in charge. Lie. I wondered if Amber knew that she'd just lied. The worst lies are the ones we tell ourselves. Amber intended to be top dog, one way or another. What parental support has Jade got? I asked. She's been formally adopted by two of the witches, Leanne and Jasmine. They were good friends with her parents. They're lovely people and Jade seems to like them well enough, but not enough to confide in them. She didn't go to them about the sack. How old is Jade? She's seven. Such a hard age to lose a parent. Any age was hard to lose a parent, but I couldn't imagine it happening when I was so young. Being orphaned had derailed my life at eighteen. On my rocky days, I tried to remind myself that eighteen years was a hell of a lot more than some people got. Seven years just felt cruel. It is, Amber agreed. The softening in her tone made me give her a sideways glance. I didn't know much about her and had no idea how she'd been raised, but something in her voice made me think that she'd experienced loss at an early age too. Maybe that was why I liked her. I recognised a kindred spirit. Let's go to the cupboard and do some digging, I suggested. We can carpool. Saving this environment one car ride at a time. Hey, every little helped. Amber gave me a horrified look like I suggested that she should give me a backy on her bicycle. No, thank you. My driver's waiting for us and there isn't really room in the car for a hellhound. No problem. Give me the address and I'll meet you there. She reeled it off and I made a note in my phone. We both looked uncertainly at the small girl cuddled up to my dog. Should we wake her? I asked. No, Amber said brusquely. I'll pick her up and carry her. I looked at her dubiously. Although she gave the impression of being lithe and toned, I couldn't envision her having the strength to carry a seven-year-old, not without waking her. Amber promptly proved me wrong by slipping her arms under the sleeping girl and hoisting her into the air effortlessly like she was a weightlifting pro. Huh, I said. Who knew? I'm stronger than I look, Amber retorted, in more ways than one. Open the door, she ordered imperiously. I hastened to obey. Amber swanned out like Jade weighed nothing, carrying her easily down to where her chauffeur-driven car awaited them. Come on, I said to Gatto. Let's get down to business. We have a Christmas sack to find. Lucy had told me to go out for the day. I got the feeling that I was being a bit stifling. The business with Mr. Trent hadn't taken long at all. The rest of the afternoon stretched out before me, and the treasure hunt was just what the doctor ordered. The address that Amber gave for the coven was nothing like I'd expected. It was an apartment block rather than a witchy old mansion. I parked downstairs in the basement. Amber had told me to use a visitor's parking space. Gatto and I headed up to the reception area, where the concierge greeted us with a friendly smile. He didn't bat an eyelid at Gatto, which surprised me, since pets weren't usually allowed in apartment blocks. Good afternoon. Who are you here to see? Amber Delia, please. I'll see if she is available for you. What's your name? Jinx. She's expecting me. No problem. Just one moment. He picked up a phone from the desk and dialed one. I wondered if the coven mother hated being speed dialed too. Uh, Miss Jinx is here to see you, Mr. Lear. There was a pause. Of course. He hung up the phone. She's waiting for you in the main socialising area. Floor 21. The lift is just here to your left. Thank you. As I turned to grab the lift, I saw a small poodle by the concierge's feet. She was carrying behind him, keeping a good distance between herself and Gatto. Other dogs just don't like him. I guess that was why the concierge was perfectly okay with me having my dog with me. It looked like the apartment block allowed pets, even while you were working. It was a work policy I could get behind. The day was always better with a fur baby by your side. I hit the call button for the lift, and a moment later the door pinged open. Gatto hit the button for 21 with his big paw before sitting on his haunches. Show off, I murmured. He gave me a doggy grin. The lift moved off smoothly. Everything said top-of-the-line luxury. It was no wonder that Amber's fees were so high if she had to fund a place like this. We stepped out into the main socialising area. 
There was a large dining table with lots of chairs clustered around it on one side of the room, and on the other side were plenty of sofas, including a gargantuan corner one. There were smaller tables for people to sit around and have a chat. The place was empty except for Amber standing with two other women, Leanne and Jasmine, I guessed. I gave an awkward hand wave. Hi, I called out. Jinx, Amber greeted me. This is Leanne. She gestured to the tall, freckled brunette on her right. And this is Jasmine. She nodded at the straight-haired Chinese woman on her left. Jasmine was diminutive in height, and her hip-length hair only served to accentuate her tiny stature. Leanne, however, was almost six feet tall, and her stance and body language spoke of her protectiveness for Jasmine. Lovers, then. My honour to meet you. I touched my hand to my heart and gave a little bow, which was a polite way to greet someone new in the other realm. Both women copied my gesture and murmured the formulaic words. I scanned the sofas around us. Where's Jade? She woke up on the return journey. She's ensconced in the cinema room, watching a movie with a couple of the other children. Great stuff. I turned to Jade's guardians. What can you tell me about the Christmas sack? Do you remember ever seeing it? Definitely. Jasmine nodded emphatically. When she moved into our family apartment, Jade had a few things for Halloween and Easter and Christmas. We put them all together in a bag and stored it in the utility cupboard where we hang coats and keep our shoes in the hoover, things like that. All true. Okay, so what about that bag with the seasonal stuff? Is it still there? Yes, and everything else is there too. We went through it with Jade once we realised that the sack was missing. Amber rifled in her voluminous pockets and pulled out the photograph she'd shown me earlier on her phone. Wordlessly, she passed it to me. I studied it briefly before slipping it into my bum bag. Then I turned back to Leanne and Jasmine. What made you realise that the sack was missing? We were preparing for Christmas and putting up the decorations. I wanted to check the size of the sack so that I knew how many bits and pieces I needed to get to fill it. I didn't want Jade's first Christmas here to fall flat. When I couldn't find it, I thought that she'd already pulled it out herself, Leanne said. When I asked Jade about it, she got really frantic and tore her room apart looking for it. With hindsight, I should have checked before I asked her about it. Then I could have had a replacement made without her knowing. But now that she knows it's missing, I'm sure she'll inspect it. The sight is wrong stitch and she'll know it's a copy. Obviously, she wants the one her mum made her. I feel awful that it's gone missing, but I've no idea what's happened to it. Her frustration and self-reproach were very evident. Who has access to your apartment? Everyone. The cabin has an open door policy. Obviously, bedrooms can be locked for privacy, but there's such a community spirit that we all flow in and out of each other's homes, Jasmine admitted. That made things significantly harder. I had been hoping it would be just them and a cleaning team. A lot of other children being raised by the coven. There are eight at the moment, three boys and five girls. Two of the girls are teenagers and one of the boys is a toddler. The other five are aged between five and eight. They spend a lot of time together. And does Jade spend time with them? Sometimes, but she's pretty quiet these days. Does she used to live in the apartment complex with her parents? Yes, Josh and Emma were lovely. They are both well liked here. Leanne put her arm around Jasmine, who rested her head on her partner's shoulder and closed her eyes in a moment of grief. I knew how she felt. Grief wasn't constant. It eddied and flowed and punched you in the face when you weren't looking. Jasmine had just got suckered. Her lips trembled and her eyes filled. She took a moment to brace herself and I stayed quiet while she struggled for control. She swiped at her cheeks. Sorry. It's okay, I know it's hard and I'm sorry for asking all of these questions. What was Jade like before her parents died? Was she outgoing? You say she's quiet now. She was outgoing once. Jasmine's eyes filled with tears again. She was always a chatty little thing, very responsible and older than her age. She took the hind legs off a donkey. She was fascinated with how things worked, always asking a million questions. But since Josh and Emma passed, she's been withdrawn. Leanne wrapped Jasmine in a full hug. We're doing our best, she murmured quietly. And Jasmine nodded against her shoulder. They embraced for a steadying moment, before Jasmine stepped back. We were best friends with Josh and Emma. Jade always called us Auntie Jasmine and Auntie Leanne, Jasmine continued. 
We haven't gotten around to having a child of our own yet, so it's been a steep learning curve. Where does Jade go to school? She's homeschooled by the coven. All of our children are until they reach high school age, at which point they enter mainstream education, Amber explained. Who else has access to the coven's apartments? As I said, Jasmine confirmed, the coven has an open door policy. We're all allowed visitors, but they log in with the concierges, Joe, Frank or Bernard. The concierges keep a record of who comes and goes. Yes, for fire safety, if nothing else. We always know exactly who's on coven property at any one time. Well, that could be handy. If the sack had been stolen by someone from outside, the logs would at least give me somewhere to start searching. But first, I had to eliminate the members of the coven. A thought occurred to me. Witches could scry for missing people, so I wondered if they could do the same for things. Can you scry for objects? I asked. It seemed like an OTO's question. If they could scry for an object, then Amber would probably have done it. There again, scrying was expensive, so perhaps Amber had deemed it not worth it. I was probably cheaper. Amber shook her head. No, we can find people, but not inanimate objects. Okay. I studied the three women. Is there anything else you think I should know? Leanne cleared her throat. <clears throat> she hasn't got a familiar. Her eyes darted quickly towards Amber before they flew away again. The other children tease her sometimes because she hasn't got a familiar. Is that something she'll acquire later in life? No one knows, really. Normally a familiar is an animal that finds its way to you when you first enter the other. We talked about it quite a lot with Josh and Emma. They were worried that she didn't have one, even though she'd been introduced to the other a few years ago. When was she introduced? When she was five. What does a familiar do? That's coven business, Amber said firmly. Does not having one put Jade at a significant disadvantage? No, she'll be able to do everything the other witches can do, Amber replied. And remind me, witches can be boys and girls, right? Of course, Amber confirmed, her tone flat. Okay, so the boys that she plays with are witches too. Leanne nodded. Despite popular culture, witches isn't a gendered term in the other. It's not our gender that defines us as witches, but our innate magic, our ability to manipulate the runes. I'd like to speak to the kids if that's okay, I said. Get a vibe for who might have something to do with the missing sack. Being a truth seeker was something that I kept under wraps, but I was open about the fact that I was an empath. Most people accepted that explanation as to why I got a feeling about when someone was telling the truth. Liars got more tense and stressed when they were lying, even if I were simply an empath. I'd still have an inside track on who was being truthful. Amber's eyes were all too knowing. The movie will be done in twenty minutes. Why don't you go and take a look in Jade's room first? Sure, that works. I shrugged. This was Amber's gig and she was paying me. I was happy to do things her way. I'll show you where it is, Leanne offered. We're just a floor down. The family is all based around the communal areas. They say it takes a village to raise a child, and we take that seriously here. Everyone mucks in with childcare responsibilities. So you must have looked after Jade before her parents died? Sure, we babysat her quite regularly, but taking the parental role is very different to babysitting. No doubt, I agreed. It was nice meeting you, I said, before Leanne led me back to the lifts. We could take the stairs, I suggested. Gatto preferred to hair up and down the stairs. Why not? This way, then. She led me to the staircase. How many people live in this apartment block? I asked. Are people allowed to live outside the coven building? Of course, but most choose not to. The other can be a lonely place at times, and having a community and its support is such a blessing. And it helps us organise when we can go to the hall and then to the common realm to recharge. The magical creatures, that was your dragons, trolls and griffins, etc., didn't need to recharge in common like their human magical counterparts. It was one of the biggest disadvantages of being human. As a dragon, my boyfriend, Emery, never had to venture into the common realm. What do you do as a job? I asked Leanne. I'm a security rune expert. I work mostly on commercial or high-end private properties. You must get to see a lot of the other. I travel a lot, but never so far that I can't get back home at the end of the day. What does Jasmine do? She's a healer. Does she work in the common realm too? She's qualified as a nurse in the common, but 
She found not being able to help the people there too hard. Couldn't she help them on the sly? No. To work, the runes have to be activated by your own innate magic. People from the common realm don't have magic, so Jazz could paint all the runes she wanted with all the finest of potions and nothing would happen. She wasn't used to seeing patients die and it was too much for her. Now she just works as a healer in the other. That must have been tough. It was, it still is. She still blames herself for losing Josh and Emma. They were in a car crash. Yes, and Jasmine was in the car with them. She was knocked out. When she came to, they both passed away. There was nothing she could have done, but she still blames herself. I could relate to that too closely. My best friend Lucy was dying from exposure to an incubus. What that incubus had done to her was illegal in both realms, but it hadn't stopped him. And neither had I. I still felt like I was to blame for Lucy's condition because I couldn't save her. Not yet, anyway. And I still hadn't given up hope of finding some sort of cure for her. But as the days went by and she got sicker and sicker in front of my eyes, it was hard to think that it would all end in a happily ever after. Sometimes, stuff happened, and there was nothing you could do but keep wading through it. Chapter 4 Leanne and Jasmine's apartment was the definition of chic. There were oil paintings on the wall, faux fur rugs on the floor, and beautiful fabric sofas, full of silk scatter cushions. Bar the few scrawled drawings on the fridge, you wouldn't have known that a child lived there. I pulled out the picture that Amber had given me. It had been folded, and unfolded so many times that it had creases. I showed it to Gatto. Here, I said, this is the sack we're after. He gave me a flat look as if to say, I can't send the sack through the photo. I'm just showing it to you so you know what we're looking for, I said lightly. He gave two taps of his tail and went off for a prowl. Give me a bark if you find something, I called after him, then tucked the photo away again. The apartment was a decent-sized space, mostly open plan. The modern kitchen had dark blue cabinets, finished with bright copper fixtures and fittings. Next to it was a dining area, currently laid for four people, and a lounge area that had the TV as a focal point. Below the wall-mounted TV was a flat-screen gas fire, off the hallway was a family bathroom with a bath and a shower fitted over it. There was a pepper pig toothbrush by the sink. I had a quick look in the cabinets, more to be nosy than because I was expecting to find the sack there. They held the usual things, toilet roll, toothpaste, deodorant, no drugs or any other big red flags. I left the bathroom and went to explore the bedrooms. Leanne and Jasmine's was large with a king-sized bed. Curled up on each pillow was a cat. Oh, hello, I greeted them in surprise. One of them blithely ignored me while the other looked up before settling back down again. Don't mind me, I'm just snooping around. I was talking to the cats like they were intelligent beings, but there again, my dog was hella smart, so who knew how clever these cats were? In the other realm, it was always best not to assume anything. I'd learnt that the hard way. Leanne and Jasmine had an ensuite bathroom. It was immaculately clean, and had a cat litter box tucked neatly into one corner. There was nothing interesting in their cabinets, either. I had a good rifle through the bedroom cupboards and found a plethora of wrapped Christmas presents, tucked away, ready for the big day. But no hessian sacks. I was usually pretty good at retrieving lost or stolen objects, but generally they were priced as artifacts, and Wilfred Samuel knew exactly where I would find them. The werewolf frequently hired me to find items that he had accidentally misplaced in a poker game. Luckily, he always did his homework. Each object that I had to find always came with a dossier of information. This time, all I had was a lousy picture. It wasn't much to go on. And the sack was priceless for Jade, but it didn't mean a whole lot to anybody else. So the only reason I could come up with for someone taking it was sheer mean-spiritedness. Despite what Amber had said, the other children were the prime suspects. I went next to Jade's room. Gatto was sniffing determinedly at a plant pot in the corner. He barked and looked at me like I should know what he was trying to convey. She likes plants, I asked. He tilted his head and gave me a look. I hadn't interpreted his bark correctly. It wasn't an exact science. I shrugged. Sorry, boy. I don't know what you mean, but I'll have a good look around. Jade's room had obviously once been Leanne's office. 
There was still a calendar on the wall that had various jobs marked on it, and the walls were painted uninspiring magnolia, a contrast to the rest of the warm apartment. I guess this hadn't been a room that Leanne spent much time in, and decor hadn't been a priority. Jade hadn't tried to make the room her own. There were no posters or pictures on the walls other than a solitary framed picture of her with her parents. Her bed was neatly made, with a pink fluffy throw tossed over it. There was a unicorn soft toy tucked next to the pillow. A desk sat in one corner of the room. In its drawer were various school books for Jade, as well as a handful of pens, some hair bobbles, and a hairbrush. In her wardrobe, everything was neatly arranged by item and colour. At the bottom of the wardrobe was a big box. I opened it and rifled through. There were pages and pages of drawings, as well as letters to her parents. and They made my heart ache. Jade had clearly written them since they died, and her anguish positively poured off the pages. Her letters were simple, written in big, childlike lettering. A letter to her mum saying how she loved her and wanted a cuddle and kiss. My eyes welled up and a rock lodged in my throat. I had to help this girl. She needed this last tangible connection to them, darn it. I was going to find her Christmas sack. I carefully and respectfully packed everything back into her special memory box and returned it to the cupboard. There were a few fabric boxes filled with toys underneath the large desk, and by Jade's bedside table was a kid's shelf filled with books. A pink unicorn nightlight sat on the bedside table, with several books stacked up next to it. Even at seven years old, Jade liked to read to herself. "'What are you doing here?' she asked from behind me, making me jump. "'Jade, you startled me. Sorry, I'm here to look for your Christmas sack. It's not here,' she said grumpily. "'You're not a very good detective if you think it is.' "'I don't think it's here,' I agreed, "'but it's best to eliminate all the obvious places first. "'I'm sorry about your mum and dad. "'My parents died when I was young, too.' "'Yeah?' she asked. "'But her tone was disinterested. "'My loss wasn't the same as her loss. Seven year olds are somewhat lacking in empathy. "'Yeah, it was hard losing them. Uh "'Uh-huh.' Do you want to talk about losing your parents? I wasn't sure she would, but I could empathise. Maybe she would open up to me. Can you bring them back? She asked, almost angrily. No. Sorry. Then what's the point in talking about it? She asked sullenly. Her expression brightened as she spotted Gatto, and she moved over to him. Hello, boy. He gave a wag and a big lick across her cheek. Oh, she said. But she laughed, and it transformed her whole appearance. As she threw her arms around his neck and hung off him for a moment, I caught a glimpse of the child her parents must have seen. She sighed into Gatto's neck. You don't want to be my familiar, do you, boy? That would show them. Who? The other coven kids. Do they tease you? She gave a one-shouldered shrug. They're fine. You don't think one of them took the sack? She thought about it for a long minute. Maybe Isabel. She's mean. I'll speak to them all, I promised. If it's one of them, I'll find it. And if it's not, then I'll still find it, I promised rashly. She smiled directly at me for the first time. Thank you. She settled on her bed and pulled one of the books off the table. Apparently I was dismissed, however, I wasn't ready to be dismissed. "'What's the deal with familiars?' I asked. "'Why are they so important? "'They're a witch's best friend and protector all in one. "'A witch without a familiar is like a pepper with no George. "'Doesn't make sense. "'Like a ying without a yang.' "'She shrugged, not getting my reference. "'Whatever, they look after us. "'They love us and they protect us. "'But Leanne and Jasmine just have cats. "'They're not like sphinxes or cat shifters.' She laughed at my ignorance. No, they're just cats. But they can tap into magic through the bond with their witch. They'll attack anyone that tries to hurt their witch. Attack them with their claws? I asked, thinking that would be largely ineffective. No, with magic, silly. She rolled her eyes at me. Did your parents have familiars? Yeah. What happened to them when your parents passed? They died too. They dropped dead. 
Minx fell off her perch. I'm sorry, that must have been so awful for you. Losing her family pets on top of her parents was the grief cherry on top of the awful cake. Poor kiddo. I tried not to show how much empathy I felt for her. She was in tough cookie mode, and I knew how that felt. Yeah, but they didn't save Mummy and Daddy. Well, they weren't in the car, I pointed out. Jasmine was, she said sullenly. Well, she was unconscious, knocked out. She couldn't have saved them, I offered gently. Yeah. She gave another one-shouldered shrug and picked at her nails. But you still blame her, I said softly. No. Lie. I grimaced internally at the ping. Being adopted and raised by the person you partly blamed for your parents' death would be so hard. And Jade was already struggling. What a quagmire of rubbish. The sack was really the last of the witch's worries. Chapter 5 I left Jade in her room and wandered out. Leanne and Jasmine were bustling around in the kitchen. I'll just go and speak to the other children, I explained. Do whatever you need to do, Jasmine said. Please, just find the sack. We can't let her down for her first Christmas with us. I'll do my best, I promised. She's due to have a friend for a play day. If you need to come back in, just open the door. There's no need to knock. Thanks, I replied. Their attitude to security was making me twitch. If they were so open doorsy, anyone could have wandered in and snatched the damn thing. Gato and I went upstairs to the main socialising area. The children were sitting at the long dining room table, having an afternoon snack. I decided a casual chat was the way to go. Hey guys, mind if I join you? No one said anything. Since there were no objections, I sat down next to some of the older children. Amber and another witch were watching me from afar. I'm Jess. What are your names? They reluctantly offered their names, but not much more. What does everyone want for Christmas? I inquired into the stony silence. An icebreaker. The youngest boy next to me, Chris, reeled off a list of about fifty things that he wanted, including a dinosaur that could walk and make noise. His talkative nature set the rest of the table at ease, and soon everyone else was chiming in with the presents that they hoped Father Christmas would bring. The older children glanced knowingly at me when the younger children said Father Christmas, but they didn't do anything to shatter their illusions. "'What do you leave out for Father Christmas?' I asked. Edward offered a very thorough explanation as to why he would like to have Bailey's Irish cream and a mince pie, rather than whiskey. "'You get bored of your whiskey at every house,' Chris chimed in. I smiled a little. Father Christmas would get tipsy if he had whiskey at every house. What do you leave out for Father Christmas to put your presents into? We went around the table. The answers varied from sacks, pillowcases, stockings, or, in Chris's case, a special Christmas Eve box. Jade has lost her Christmas sack, I said sadly, the one her mum made for her. That's not all she lost. Isabel muttered nastily under her breath. I quirked an eyebrow in question. And she folded her arms defensively. She's lost her manners. She's rude. She doesn't acknowledge you when you walk past or say her please and thank yous. She's lost her parents, I pointed out. Six months ago. How long do you think it would take you to get over losing your parents? It's been seven years for me and I promise you I'm still not over it. And I'm twenty-five and I lost them when I was eighteen. She's seven. Cut her some slack. My voice was perhaps a little harder than it should have been when speaking to children, but Isabel's attitude had rubbed me the wrong way. Everyone treats her like she's a princess. She gets everything she wants. Except her parents, I snapped back. It was hard for me to be objective while talking about something like this. I decided to cut to the chase. I couldn't make Isabel more empathetic to Jade, but I could find what Jade was desperately looking for. Did you take Jade's Christmas sack? I asked Isabel directly. No, Isabel bit out, affronted. True. Do you know who did? No, she repeated, folding her arms and glaring at me. True. I went round all the children asking the same question, and they all replied in the negative. Unfortunately, all of them were telling the truth, so I was now out of suspects. Darn. After chatting a bit longer with the coven children, I made my excuses and left the table. 
Amber had been watching me from a few seats away. The other witch had left, so I sat down on the sofa opposite her. None of them are involved in the sack's disappearance, I confirmed. So what's your next step? I considered. I was drawing a blank. Gatto seemed to think the plant in the bedroom was important. Any idea why? No, but I've seen Jade spend time with a dryad kid here. Bingo. Do you know the kid's name or where I can find them? Not a clue, but Leanne, Jasmine or Bill, the concierge, will be able to help you. I decided to head downstairs to speak to Leanne and Jasmine. Presumably one of them would be able to set up a meet with the dryad easily enough. Thankfully the stars were aligned in my favour. When I walked in, Jade and a little dryad boy were playing in the front room with some colouring books. I guessed he was Jade's play date. Next to Jasmine and Leanne in the dining room area was a dryad I didn't recognise. Presumably the little boy's mum. Jinx, Jasmine said as she stood up. Back so soon? Do you find out anything? She asked eagerly. I questioned the coven kids, but I don't think any of them are involved. I turned to the dryad mother. My honour to meet you. My name is Jinx. I gave her the funny little bow, which she returned. My honour to meet you, Jinx. My name is Rebecca. What's your son's name? Scott. How did Scott meet Jade? I asked curiously since Jade didn't attend mainstream school. I grew up with Emma. The kids always played together. Oh, sorry for your loss. I muttered the empty words because it was expected of me, but... But I knew from personal experience that they meant precisely nothing at all. Thanks. Are you okay with me speaking to Scott? About the sack, I've already asked him about it, but go right ahead. I could tell from her expression that she thought it was a waste of time, but she was happy for me to fill my boots. Jade smiled as I approached. She has a hellhound, she told Scott excitedly. Look, his name is Gatto. Cool, Scott beamed. Can I stroke him? Obligingly, Gatto moved closer. Go right ahead, I said. As both children started to pet Gatto, I watched Scott closely. Do you know where Jade's Christmas sack is? He froze, just for a second. But I saw it. Blink, and I would have missed it. No, he said lightly. Lie. But I'm sure it will turn up. True. He knew where it was, but he was planning on returning it. Relief flooded through me. At least I hadn't inadvertently lied to Jade when I'd promised I'd find it. You're fibbing, I said softly. You took it. Why? Scott, Jade said in a tremulous voice. Scott glared at me. You're ruining everything. He huffed visibly as he turned to Jade. It was supposed to be your Christmas present, only I was going to give it to you before. You showed it to me a few months ago and I noticed it had a hole in the bottom. Imagine if Father Christmas put in your presents and then they fell out. One of the pixies said she'd fix it for you, so I took it last time we had a play date. I was going to put it back. Jade was clearly conflicted. She was relieved that the sack was somewhere to be retrieved, but still upset that it had been taken. Scott's heart had been very much in the right place, albeit the execution was a bit off. "'Why don't you just tell me?' she asked, confused. "'I've been really sad. It wouldn't have been a surprise if I told you.' Scott's mum, Rebecca, narrowed her eyes at him. "'You told me you had nothing to do with it going missing,' she said through gritted teeth. "'It wouldn't be a surprise if everyone knew about it.' "'What is it with you and surprises?' Rebecca asked in exasperation. "'Everyone loves a surprise,' he said innocently, eyes wide. "'You love a surprise, Scott, not everyone else. Come on, we'd better go and speak to the Pixies.' "'Can I come with you?' I asked on impulse. After all, it didn't feel like the sack had actually been found until I had it in my hands. "'I suppose,' she said dubiously. "'But the Pixies are rather shy.' If they don't want me there, I'll leave, I promised. She looked at Gatto. He won't fit in my car. Can you stay here with me? Jade asked eagerly. I looked at Gatto and he gave two tail taps. He is happy to stay with you. I hastily turned to Leanne and Jasmine. If that's okay with you. No problem. Cats will probably avoid him. He's fine with that. Could I trouble you for a bowl of water for him? Of course. Jasmine stood and filled him a bowl with water. Let's go, I said to Rebecca. I was excited, but trying to play it cool. 
It was time to meet some pixies. Chapter 6 On the drive to the pixies, I gave Lucy a quick call. She reassured me that she was fine, but her tone was a bit exasperated. I was being annoying. How are you feeling? I couldn't help but ask. The same as before. I'm fine. She wasn't fine. She was dying. But she'd made me promise not to bring it up over Christmas. Since the death of my parents, I spent most of my Christmases at Lucy's parents' house. Her mum, Sandy, had all but adopted me, and her dad, Dennis, was always passing me a biscuit, like he thought I was too thin. I appreciated every minute of the fuss they made of me, even when I tried my best to push them away. Her brother Ben and I had once had a small drunken thing that I'd never told a soul about, including Lucy. It had been awkward for a year or two, but we were cool now. It was just in a box of never to be mentioned. How did your case go? Lucy asked. The husband? Have you taken another case since we spoke? She laughed. Actually, yes, the husband's case was all tied up very quickly. Heh <laughs> I thought. I've taken on another case. Someone has lost their Christmas sack. Are you kidding? It's a very serious crime, I said solemnly, eyeing Scott next to me. He shrank further into his seat. I felt bad for teasing him, so I added, but all's well that ends well. I've nearly found it. So you're free this evening. I brightened. Sure. Maybe she was relenting and a girl's night was on the cards. Maybe takeout and a movie. Good. Emery came knocking and I told him you were free. He'll pick you up at 7pm, wherever you are. I told him you were in Liverpool somewhere. Have a great time. Lucy, I don't have time to go on dates. I should be looking for ways to save your life. Looking after you. I don't need a keeper, she said firmly. I love you. Go have fun for one night. I'll see you tomorrow. Okay, Jess. Tomorrow, I agreed. Liverpool was a three and a half hour drive from Lucy. I had planned to drive back tonight, but it seemed like she wanted more space than just a few hours. I needed to grab a hotel in Liverpool somewhere. I thought briefly of the other hotel, a hard day's night, but quickly dismissed the idea. The Connection used it as their headquarters, and although I had no hard feelings towards the Connection, per se, I didn't want to risk running into stone. I'd find another hotel that would take dogs. But now there was a whole date with Emery to throw into the mix, and I had no idea where he would take me. I also had nothing to wear other than jeans and a plain top. Not ideal for second date territory, and if this was a Christmas date, was I supposed to get Emery a present? What did you get a guy who got everything? I mean... He was a millionaire, and he could buy anything he wanted. I liked Emery. He was kind, generous, and funny. Not to mention sexy. The guy exuded sex appeal. But we didn't know each other well enough for me to feel confident putting together a sentimental present. It was a conundrum. You're a P.I. Mysteries are your gig. You can do this, I told myself. Lie. Ugh. What am I supposed to get Emery for a Christmas present? I asked Lucy desperately. Yourself? In a bow? I could almost see her wink over the phone. I sighed. Oh, you're no help. I'm serious. Life's too short, she said somberly. Love you. I've got to go. I winced as she rang off before I could reply. Her voice had gotten thick and heavy, like she was struggling with tears. Rebecca parked outside Sefton Park. Scott took his mother's hand and led us towards the palm house. The pixies live in the palm house? I asked in surprise. No, silly, just next to it. Scott rolled his eyes. Scott, manners. Not everyone knows everything, you know. Everyone knows the pixies live by the palm house, he muttered. You're a dryad. That's one of those things that dryads know. No doubt Jinx knows things that only wizards know. The palm house reared out of Sefton Park like a monumental greenhouse. It was a dome-shaped Victorian building filled with lush flora and fauna. These days it was used as a location for charity, dance and music events. You could even get married there. I'd have thought that there was a bit too much hustle and bustle for pixies. Then again, I knew precisely nothing at all about pixies. Maybe they liked music and dance events. Just before we reached the palm house, Rebecca led us down a side path through a section of willow trees that looked naked and bedraggled in the winter cold. 
She stopped by the biggest one. Go on, then, she said to Scott. Without hesitation, he bounded into the willow tree. Watching someone merge with a tree was not something that I'd grown used to, but I managed to swallow my surprise exclamation. Dryad's jinx, remember? Rebecca and I stood for a beat or two, exchanging slightly awkward smiles, but we didn't have to wait for long. Out came Scott, giggling, next to an honest-to-goodness pixie. She couldn't have been more than a foot tall. She had wings on her back like a butterfly, but they were the size of my hands. She wore a simple green dress and had matching green skin, the same as the dryads. When she saw me, she flew closer to Scott. "'You didn't say anything about a wizard!' she accused him. "'She's a detective,' he said glumly. "'The one that found out we took the sack. "'And ruined the surprise!' the pixie buzzed in irritation. She glared at me for good measure. "'Jade has been very upset,' I pointed out. "'Well, if she'd just been patient and waited for Christmas Eve to look for her sack, none of this would have happened!' She sounded annoyed. "'Anyway, I've done no repairs. It's good as new!' She darted back into the willow tree and came out moments later, carrying the sack. I reached down to take it. "'What are you going to give me for it?' she asked, holding it back at the last minute. Marsha. Scott exclaimed, chastened. Just give it to her. No, I don't think I will. Marsha quickly shoved the sack back into the tree, so it hung half in, half out. Scott went to tug it out, but it remained stubbornly wedged in the tree. Don't pull it! Marsha shouted. If you break it, I'll be cross and I'll sting you! She bared her teeth at Scott, revealing a mouthful of tiny pinprick teeth, like a row of sharp needles. Yeek! You'd need a tetanus injection after a nibble from those. Bloody pixies, Rebecca muttered. She stepped forward and pulled him away from the threatening pixie. It was turning out to be one of those days. What do you want for the sack? I asked the little troublemaker. She smiled coquettishly. Oh, not much. Just a little favour. What kind of favour? I don't know because I don't need it yet. Just a little I.O.U. will do nicely. You're going to give it back to Scott for free, just give it to me. Scott is my friend. He finds me all the best flowers. You've never given me so much as a petal. So no, it's a favour. Or no sack. I sighed aloud and thought it through. The best negotiations needed some parameters. Your favour must not be malicious in intent or harm anyone, and it must be temporary in duration. There. That would cover me, wouldn't it? Agreed, said Marsha triumphantly. She reached in and pulled out the sack then, all happiness and light, delivered it into my hands. Yeah, I'm not buying that now, sugar, I thought. Thank you for fixing it. I'm sure Jade will be very happy to see it, Scott said, oblivious to the malicious side of the pixie's nature. No doubt, Rebecca agreed tightly. I asked you about the sack and you lied to me. You've upset Jade. Next time I ask you a question, Scott, I expect you to tell me the truth she said firmly to her dishonest offspring. Course, Scott agreed. Lie. Rebecca had her hands full, poor woman. Go on, play with Marsha. I'll come and pick you up in an hour after I've dropped Jinx back at the coven. Marsha flashed Scott a happy smile and grabbed his hand, pulling him rapidly into the willow tree before he could even say goodbye. Marsha seemed a bit... bitey? Unstable? I settled on changeable. All the pixies are like that, but the dryads and the pixies have a treaty. She's not allowed to sting him, so she's mostly bluster, and she does love him, really. He knows that, so he ignores her when she blows hot and cold. Come on, I'll drive you back to the coven. I don't want to deprive Jade of her sack for a moment longer. The return journey seemed much quicker. I signed in at the concierge's desk again, and headed up to Jade's apartment. I had my own Christmas gift in mind for her. It probably wasn't a good idea, but sometimes life wasn't about playing safe. It was about doing the right thing. Chapter 7 Jade let out a happy scream as soon as she saw the sack in my hands. You found it! She gave an ear-piercing shriek, jumped up and down on the spot, and I hastily handed it to her before she bowled me over. She cuddled the Hessian sack to her chest as she tore into the lounge, where Leanne and Jasmine were waiting. She found it! Look, she found it! She threw herself into Leanne and Jasmine's open arms, and they had a family cuddle that brought a lump to my throat. 
Jade might not be quite there yet, but she was getting closer to accepting Leanne and Jasmine as her new family. I waited patiently for them to have their moment. Jade stepped away from Leanne and Jasmine and barreled towards me. I had a second to interpret her intentions before she jumped into my arms. Luckily, I was prepared to catch her and accept her enthusiastic hug. It was rare for someone to hug me, except for Lucy, so I held on tight. Even I needed a hug now and again. You're the best detective ever! I thought about explaining that I was a private investigator and not a detective, but I thought the nuance would be lost on her. Thanks, I said instead. I'm happy to have helped. Why don't you see me and Gatto to the lift? She started to lead me out, still carrying the Christmas sack. Perhaps you'd better leave the sack at home. We really don't want to lose it again. Good thinking, she asserted. She took it back to the cupboard where it belonged and put it safely away. When we were outside of the apartment, I tugged Jade to a stop. I have a serious question for you and it needs a serious answer. She nodded solemnly. If you could see your parents again, even knowing that you have to leave them and come back here, would you do it? Yes, she said simply. Of course. You'd have to say goodbye to them all over again. At least I get to say goodbye. Can you do it? What kind of magic do you have? She asked in wonder. Please do it. Don't tease me. Can you do it? Not me. Him. I pointed to Gatto. Take us to the third pup, to her parents, before I change my mind. I reached out and held Jade's hand tightly as Gatto leapt towards my forehead. Nothing's happened. Disappointment laced her tone. Just wait, where did you used to live? I hoped to hell she knew her old apartment number. Next to Leanne and Jasmine. This way. Looking at me with suspicion that you shouldn't see in a seven-year-old's eyes, she pulled me forward. She was old before her age, and I could see disappointment in the curve of her shoulders. She thought it was a hoax. If it had been, it would have been of the cruelest type. She knocked once on her old front door and strode in without waiting for an answer. She was halfway into the hallway when she froze abruptly. Mum? Dad? she said tremulously. I recognised Emma and Josh straight away from the photographs. Emma looked down at the toddler in arms and back up to the little girl running towards her. Jade? she said in disbelief. Mum! Jade said. And then she started to cry and cry. Straight away Emma tried to comfort her mysteriously older daughter. All the while little Jade wriggled and writhed in her arms. I'll take her, I offered. My name's Jinx, and I helped Jade come here to see you. I'll take care of this little one while you have a moment. Emma hesitated, but older Jade's needs were very clear, and trustingly she handed me the toddler. Little Jade was around eighteen months old. When I picked her up, she reached out and put her finger up my nose. No thank you, I said, gently pulling her hand away. I set her down in the lounge, which was full of toys, and pulled a bag of blocks towards us so we could build some towers. On the other side of the room, Josh and Emma were comforting their inexplicably older daughter, and shooting me confused glances. They cuddled, and held Jade until the sobbing stopped. It took a long while. I didn't blame her. I'd been in a real quandary about whether or not this was the right thing to do, but when faced with the loss of my own parents, I had gone back in time and met them again, and it had healed something in me. Like me, Jade hadn't had the chance to say goodbye. Saying goodbye didn't make the loss easier, but at least you had some element of closure. Playing with the Third Realm wasn't something that you could do lightly, because going into it did something to your mind. If I did it too regularly, I'd become lost, mixed up and muddled up like Leo Harfin, with a kind of otherworldly-induced dementia. It wasn't something I would do lightly, but my morality demanded that I did something, no matter the price. It was my Christmas gift to Jade, the most precious thing I could give her. Time with her parents. Little Jade and I were playing quite nicely. I was stacking up some rubber blocks for her to knock over, which made her burst into gales of laughter. Sometimes she helped me put the blocks back up, but mostly she delighted in destroying what I had wrought. She had what I expect her parents would call half a dozen words. Unfortunately, I wasn't too good with children, so to me, the sounds were barely comprehensible, but I could guess what she wanted from the general context. 
After half an hour, older Jade stopped crying, and little Jade had fallen asleep. I carefully picked up the young one and found the nursery by a process of elimination. I placed her gently into her cot and prayed that she wouldn't wake up. I exhaled loudly with relief when she went down without waking, then promptly clapped my hands over my mouth. I crept out of the room like I was leaving a motion sensor bomb. When I returned to the lounge, Josh and Emma were talking quietly with their daughter. She stopped crying but was still clinging fiercely to their hands. She told them what happened to them about the car accident and how they'd left her, and that now she lived with Leanne and Jasmine. She told them that she didn't have a familiar, and she still didn't fit in with the coven kids. Gatto and I stayed as far away as possible, giving the family some privacy to talk through some pretty heavy issues. There was lots of cuddling and kissing. They were a very tactile family, and I could see how much it comforted Jade. I could almost see her shoulders ease as she told them all the stuff she bottled up for the last six months. Whatever complications it brought, I'd done the right thing by bringing her here. They talked for more than two hours while little Jade slept. It was nice to see Jade smile and laugh, even though the shadow of the coming grief was still in her eyes. Seeing her parents again had been better than nothing. Finally, Gatto barked and tapped his tail three times. He chased his tail a little, then looked at me expectantly. It was time for us to go back. He had a sense about these things, and I never questioned it, after all. He was a hellhound who controlled the portals into various different realms. Apparently, we'd spent enough time in the third, and we needed to leave before more damage was done. I'm sorry, I said softly to Jade. It's time to go back. Her bottom lip quivered. I don't want to go back. I want to stay here forever. I nodded. There was a huge lump in my throat and tears in my eyes. I knew exactly how she was feeling. I know, but we can't stay. We have to go back to our own time. Staying in the past makes your mind go crazy. Think of all the things that you'll do when you grow up. All the things that you'll achieve. You wouldn't do any of those things if you stayed here. Over time, your mind would become less and less. Until you couldn't even manage things that little Jade you can do right now. It would be no life, Josh said firmly. And that's not what we want for you, baby. You're smart and kind and clever. I want you to grow up, to have a job you're proud of, to fall in love and have a family of your own. When you have children, you'll truly know how much we love you. We'll do anything in the world to keep you safe. And today, that means sending you back to your own time. He was holding his daughter's face tenderly in his hands, and Jade was watching her father like the sun rose and set in his eyes. Emma took that moment to swipe at the tears pouring down her own cheeks. She bit her trembling lip and was clearly telling herself to get a grip. She brushed away another stray tear and cleared her throat. You have to go, love. Go and know that we are so proud of you. Jay jumped into her mum's arms. But I miss you so much. It's so hard when you're gone. Oh, baby, we're not gone. Not really. Emma kissed her daughter's cheek. I've kissed you here a million times. My love for you is always with you in an echo of a million kisses and hugs I've already given you. I'm here with you for every step of your life. I'm in your heart, darling girl, and you couldn't get rid of me if you tried. When you're thinking of being naughty, it'll be my voice telling you to be good. When you're making cookies, you'll hear me telling you not to eat them until they're cool. When you read, you'll imagine being snuggled up with Daddy every night while you explore new worlds together. We will always be with you, and we'll be watching over you forever and ever. Jade was crying again, but she nodded against her mum's chest. I love you, mummy. I love you too, my darling. We both do. I've got a little something for you. Wait a second. She gave her daughter one last squeeze and passed her to Josh for them to have another cuddle. Emma disappeared into the utility cupboard and came back with a large, fluffy bunny rabbit. Here, she said, passing it to Jade. I got it for little you, but I think big you needs it more. This is Cuddles, and I've imbued her with my love. Any time you miss us too much, give Cuddles a cuddle, and they'll be like you're cuddling us. Thanks, Mummy. We love you, Josh said. Be good for Leanne and Jasmine. They need you too. She nodded. I'll be good for them. We know you will. You're the best girl in the world. The family had another cuddle, with lots of kisses and hugs, and my heart felt heavier having to tear them apart. Gatto tapped his tail impatiently. I know, 
I said to him, just a moment more. I waited a few more beats. Go on now, Jade, wait outside with Gatto. I just need a word with your parents. Jade gave them each a fierce hug before grabbing her new bunny and walking out with Gatto. She was the bravest little girl alive. When the door shut, Josh turned to me with knowing eyes. You're going to clear us. You can't live with this knowledge. It would be awful to have it hanging over you. Josh nodded. Resigned. I agree. He scrubbed a hand across his eyes. God, this is hard. You have her now. You just have to love her now as much as you can. Six more years together isn't enough. I know, it's cruel. But Leanne and Jasmine are great with her. I hesitated. Jasmine was in the car with you. She blames herself. Emma shook her head. No, she mustn't. You need to get yourself together and move on. Quote that verbatim for me. Okay, anything else? Keep an eye on our daughter, won't you? She has Emma Delia looking over her too, but sure. The more the merrier, I guess. Josh nodded decisively. Do it then before I run away to stop you clearing us. I gathered the intention within me. I needed to remove their memories of the last few hours and replace them with the idea that they'd been sitting and chatting over a cup of tea whilst young Jade was sleeping. I focused on the images and said the release word. Clear. Their eyes went glassy and unfocused. I had a few minutes before they would come back to themselves, so I guided them to sit on the sofa and clicked on the TV. I put two mugs in the kitchen sink like they just had a brew. Then I sneaked out to take their daughter home. Chapter 8 Gatto took us and Cuddles back to our time, and we walked down the corridor to Leanne and Jasmine's apartment. Jade hesitated before she opened the door. She turned to me. Thank you. Her bottom lip quivered. I'll remember that forever. I nodded, too choked to say anything. I stepped closer to hug her. Happy Christmas, Jade. She snorted. Father Christmas can't top this. Bite your tongue. I chastened. Father Christmas is magic. I realized as I said that, to someone being raised with actual magic, Father Christmas must be real. What a lovely thing. She giggled, pulled back from our hug and gave me a grin. A real smile that shone with genuine happiness. It was like a weight had been lifted off her. Of course, there would still be good and bad days and she would still miss her parents. But now she had this memory to comfort her. She knew that she was loved. Remember, to Jasmine and Leanne, we left only a moment ago. I remember that I had a message to give to Jasmine. Get Jasmine to come to the door, will you? I asked Jade. Okay. She disappeared inside. Jasmine came to the door. Did you forget something? Not exactly. I forgot to tell you something. Jade and I talked a bit about her parents' death. She told me you were in the car with them. I've got a few different magics, and I have a message for you from Emma. She said for me to tell you, you need to get your stuff together and move on. Okay? She looked at me, eyes wide. I haven't heard the nickname Doodle in years. I used to call Emma that when we were kids. How did you know? As I said, I have some different magics. She wanted me to tell you that and give you a huge thank you for taking care of Jade. I thought of the tactile family that I had just left, and my promise to help watch over Jade. Jade is a touchy-feely child. She likes hugs and snuggles on the sofa. Maybe when you get a moment, you could help her redecorate her bedroom, so it's more like hers and a little less like Leanne's office. We've been meaning to do it, she admitted, but Jade said she wasn't bothered. I suspect she doesn't want to be a bother, but she deserves a little girl's bedroom. Emma has asked me to check in on her now and again. If that's okay with you, I'll come by once in a while. Of course. She was looking at me like I was a weird creature she couldn't quite make sense of. That was okay. I was used to being a bit odd. Well, take care, I said. Thanks for finding the Christmas sack. What do we owe you? I smiled. This one is paid by Amber Delia. I gave her a wink. Have a great Christmas, Jasmine. We will. I think we really will. I hope you do too. I checked my watch. It was nearly 6pm. The evening was drawing in and Emery was due to pick me up soon. Crap, I had nothing to wear and nowhere to get ready. I decided to throw myself on Amber's mercy. Maybe I could waive this invoice in exchange for a place to get changed. I headed up to the lounge to see if I could find her, 
but she wasn't there. I trudged all the way back down to the concierge's office and asked him to call Amber for me. He said that she was in her penthouse suite. Floor 25, he confirmed. I grabbed the lift and pressed the button for the 25th floor. I noted with interest that the lift went up to floor 26, and I wondered what was there. The coven secret lab where all of the potions were made. I was dying to have a poke around, but that probably wasn't the done thing, given that the coven had done nothing but extend warm hospitality to me. Snooping was a no-no. The lift pinged, and I headed out to Amber's door. When I knocked, she didn't leave me waiting long. Come in, she said abruptly. Thanks. As I followed her into her flat, I noted that she wasn't wearing shoes, and I hastily followed suit. The last thing I wanted to do was trudge mud into her fancy penthouse suite. So, if you have this apartment, where does the coven mother stay? I asked curiously. On the floor below. Not on the 26th floor. Interesting. I found the sack, I said triumphantly. So I hear. Jasmine and Leanne were elated. Thank you. You're welcome. I cleared my throat. Actually, I have a favour to ask. Of course you do, she said cynically. I knew it was too good to be true when you fitted us in at the last minute. What do you need? Scrying? Potions? Oh, nothing like that. I have a date with Emery, the dragon prime elite. I'm well aware who Emery is, she said dryly. He's coming to pick me up at seven and I have nothing to wear and no place to get ready. Do you have anything I can borrow? Her shoulders dropped as she relaxed a little and she even gave me a slight smile. Sure, why don't you have a shower while I raid my wardrobe? Thank you so much. Is it okay if I tell Emery to pick me up from here? Of course. You don't have any good ideas about what I could get him for Christmas, do you? Something that you could get for the Prime Elite Dragon in less than an hour. Well, it didn't sound good when she said it out like that. Um, yes. Is there, like, a spell you can do to find the perfect present for someone, or something like that? Magic isn't to be used for frivolities, she chastened. What do you get the man who has everything? You're overthinking this. What does he like? Food? Music? A good book? Music and books can be tricky because you might end up buying something he's already got. You can't go wrong with food. She thought for a moment. What about a bacon bouquet of flowers? That's a thing. Yep. Flowers for men. Flowers for me too, I muttered. I loved bacon. Can you get them in an hour? I can do most things in an hour, Amber said confidently. I'll sort it. You go and shower. Time is ticking. She led me through her bedroom into an ensuite bathroom and passed me a clean towel. Help yourself to anything. She gestured to the shampoos and body washes in her shower caddy. The shower is self-explanatory. Pop this on when you're done. She hung a clean white dressing gown on the back of the door, then shut it behind her. Come on. I heard her saying to Gatto. Let's get you something to eat so you can get comfortable too. I fired off a text to Emery to let him know where to pick me up. The man had ways of finding out information, but I thought it would be easier all round if I just told him where I was. Not everything needed to be cloak and dagger. I got an almost instantaneous response, which made me smile. He wasn't playing it cool. Time was not on my side, so I showered as quickly as I could, hastily put my hair in a head turban and pulled on the dressing gown. When I walked into the bedroom, various items of clothing were laid out on the bed. Amber, I called, can you help me pick? I was not a girly girl, and for most of the big events in my life, I normally asked Lucy to help me arrange my outfit. Amber had laid out everything from cocktail dresses to ball gowns, but I spied a few pair of jeans and some sparkly tops. I prayed one of those would fit me and look good enough for a night out. Gatto and Amber joined me. Gatto's big tongue was hanging out in a doggy laugh. He didn't see what the big deal was. This is our second proper date, I explained to Amber. I don't want to muck it up. You won't, not on clothing choice anyway. Where's he taking you? I have no idea. The man loves to fly, so I'm betting he'll be using that damned helicopter, she mused aloud. Probably not the ball gowns, she mumbled to herself as she discarded those. She looked at me critically, then discarded the cocktail dresses. You're more of a jeans girl, aren't you? Besides, they'd be better if you're climbing in and out of a helicopter. She pulled out a pair of smart black jeans and a plum red sequin top. This, she said firmly. 
She shoved them at me and pushed me towards the bathroom. Quickly, you've not got long before he'll be knocking. I got dressed and I had to say that I approved of her choice. It looked great. The only things ruining it were the trainers that I put on that morning. I came out of the bathroom barefoot. Amber nodded in satisfaction. Sit here and I'll dry your hair. I sat down at her dresser. Amber's hair always looked lovely, so I was confident she had some skills in the hairdressing department. Do you by chance wear a size six shoe? I asked. Trainers will dress down the whole outfit. I don't wear a size six, but I've called down to one of the witches who does. You know everyone's shoe size. Don't be ridiculous. Leanne asked around for you. She'll bring up some shoes shortly. Amber switched on the hairdryer, effectively ending any conversation. I was one of those people who didn't like talking at the hairdressers, so I was grateful for the excuse to fall silent. I had achieved a lot today, firstly by finding Mr. Trent, and then by retrieving the Christmas sack. My job was always quite rewarding in that sense. But I still hadn't accomplished my main goal. I still had no way to save Lucy. When Amber turned off the hairdryer, my hair was curling and cascading around my shoulders. It looked better than anything I'd ever done with it. Thanks for all of this. I know I've asked already, but you haven't found anything else that can help my friend Lucy. Jasmine's a healer. Maybe I could ask her? Amber looked at me, and I saw the faint glimmer of sympathy in her eyes. Jasmine can only heal magical people. It's the same with all the potions. Otherwise, we could heal the world. I'm sorry. There's nothing we can do to help Lucy. Right, thanks. You did say that before. I just hoped that something might have changed. I said glumly. There was a knock on Amber's door. She gave me a quick consoling squeeze on my shoulder, which was surprisingly intimate for her, before she left to open it. She returned moments later with several shoe boxes. One of these pairs will work, she said confidently. She opened up all of the boxes and confidently pulled out a pair of red ankle boots, which matched the berry-coloured top I had pulled on. These. She thrust them at me. I slipped them on and looked at myself in the full-length mirror. I looked good and Christmassy. All that was missing was a bit of makeup. Amber evidently had reached the same conclusion. Sit. She pulled back the dresser chair. She grabbed her makeup bag and rifled through it. You've got great skin, so you don't need foundation. Maybe just some blusher, mascara, and lipstick. She swiveled me on the chair so I was facing her, and expertly applied the makeup. She frowned. Eyeshadow. She pulled an eyeshadow palette out of her dresser drawer. Close your eyes, she instructed, then swiped on a few layers, creating a warm look. When she was done, I looked at the mirror in surprise. That looks great, thank you. Her apartment phone rang and she went into the hallway to answer it. Send him up, she said. She turned to me. Just in the nick of time, he's here. I'll make myself scarce. You can crash at the covered apartments tonight if you need to. We keep a spare one open on the first floor. I've told the concierge you're to use it if you need to. Thank you so much. Don't mention it. I got the vibe that she really meant those words. She didn't want me walking around talking about how nice, tough Amber Delia really was. Your bacon bouquet is in the white box in the kitchen. I'll deduct the cost from the invoice you sent me for finding the sack. That was Amber. She always had a business head on. There was a knock at the door. She gestured for me to get it and disappeared back into her bedroom, shutting the door behind her. Now that the moment was here, my stomach was suddenly full of voracious butterflies. Emery and I had been texting and calling each other quite a lot over the past few days, but we hadn't seen each other much since he had told me that Lucy was dying. She'd been my priority from that moment on. All Emery and I had managed were snatched moments here and there. What if he didn't like me in person anymore? One of the chemistry between us was gone. I went to the kitchen to open the white box. Sure enough, there was a bouquet of flowers in there, made of bacon. The meat had been glazed, rolled and cooked, and the smell was amazing. The rolls had been fixed to real rose stems. I picked up the bouquet gingerly and walked to the hallway. I hesitated by the front door until Gatto headbutted me in the bum and pushed me forward. Then he gave a bark so that Emery would know that we were in. Little scamp. Time to face the music and hope that the spark was still there. Chapter 9 I opened the door nervously to Emery. As usual, he was dressed in a suit. This one was all crisp black lines. 
But in concession to it being a date night, the shirt that he'd prepared it with was a lovely maroon, one of my favourite colours. looked amazing on him. Inadvertently, we were matching, albeit in different shades of red. He held a huge bouquet of red roses out to me. I awkwardly thrust my bunch of, well, flowers towards him. He blinked in surprise. You got me flowers. Not exactly, I admitted. Look closer. He examined my bouquet. Is that bacon? Nothing but the finest for the prime elite, I joked. He grinned. That's amazing. Nobody's ever given me flowers before, let alone ones I can eat. His stomach gave an audible growl and he looked faintly embarrassed. Sorry, I didn't have time to grab lunch today. You can eat one of your roses as an appetizer, I suggested. It's not like you're going to ruin your appetite. The man ate like he was starving, putting away enough food to feed a family of four. Given permission, he pulled one of the rose heads off and ate it in one mouthful. He let out a low groan of pleasure, which did funny things to my tummy. I flushed and tried to hide my reaction. That was amazing. It's been brushed with some sort of maple syrup. We've got to try one. I think it's a social faux pas to eat the present you give to someone. Not when they offer it. Honestly, try it. It's one of the best things I've ever eaten. I had to admit to being quite curious. Besides, unlike a real bouquet of flowers, his bacon wasn't going to last for days. I tugged a bacon roll off its fake stem and ate it in one, just like Emery. It was divine, though. I managed not to moan. That is good, I admitted. Let's eat them all, he said eagerly, making me laugh. I'm okay, I can't eat too much or I'll ruin dinner, but here. I pushed the bouquet into his hands. You take this and I'll pop the flowers in a vase. I left him devouring his gift while I hunted for a vase. I couldn't find one, so I shoved the flowers in a stray pint glass. That would do for now. Amber could enjoy them for me. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw Emery give a couple of the bacon rolls to a very happy Gatto. Gatto gave him an enthusiastic lick. He loved sharing food. You look great, Emery said belatedly when he and Gatto had demolished the whole bouquet. I'm sorry I forgot my manners with all that bacon. I got excited. He did look excited, I realised, genuinely thrilled to have gotten a present from me. It gave me a warm glow. He might have loads of money, but I wasn't sure whether he was someone who received a lot of gifts. Maybe that was one of the downsides to being rich. Everyone assumed you'd got everything you needed. I decided I'd make the effort to find out his birth date and surprise him with something awesome, if we were still doing whatever this was, of course. Shall we go? Emery offered me his arm like a gentleman from another era. Does my chariot await? I asked flippantly. Not a chariot this time, but something else. Is Gatto okay to come? I wasn't sure if Amber would want me to leave him. I should have checked. Of course, he's part of our plans. Emery winked at Gatto, who gave a happy wag. The man sure knew the way to my heart. Treat my dog right and you were halfway there. He took me to the lift and pressed for the rooftop. A helicopter ride? I guess. Amber was on the money. Got it in one. It's the only way to get there quick enough. Get where? Bonnie Scotland. He put on a Scottish accent, making me grin like a loon. Oh, awesome. Where are we going? Now that is a surprise. There were two helicopters on the roof, sitting on the coven's helipad. Who knew that they had one? Emery's pilot, Chris, was there. He beamed at me and gave me a thumbs up. Who's in the other bird? I asked, gesturing to the second helicopter. Security, Emery said shortly. I'm sorry about that. I squeezed his arm. No problem. If a helicopter full of backup meant that he could relax and enjoy the date, I was all for it. Besides, although I was still discovering the magical realm I'd stumbled into only a couple of months earlier, I had already learned that it was dangerous. Security wasn't a bad idea. Gatto made as if to join the security helicopter. You're with us, Emery called to him. Gatto gave him a flat look and a growl as if to say that he was definitely part of security. Emery interpreted his meaning correctly. Of course you're security, you're a tough hellhound, but we can't have all our eggs in one basket. He gave Gatto a head scratch. Mollified, Gatto climbed into Chris's helicopter but sat up so he could see out of the windows. He was a hound in protection mode. How was your day? Emery asked. Pretty good, I completed two quick jobs. Can you tell me about either of them? 
Client confidentiality is a thing, of course, but I figured I could tell him vague details. I got hired to find a missing Christmas sack. His lips twitched. You've been hunting for Father Christmas's sack. Not his sack, another sack. I have a sack you can see. He joked with an exaggerated leer. I burst out laughing. How are you making this lewd? It's one of my superpowers. It's a guy thing. I rolled my eyes. I found the sack and I made the kid happy. Emery took my hand, a genuine smile dancing on his lips. You're amazing. I bet you made their day. I thought of Jade and her parents. Yeah, I hope so. I did my best. We made small talk as we flew to Scotland. It didn't take as long as I expected, and soon we were setting down. Where are we? I asked. We're at the Helix Park in Falkirk. What's here? The Kelpies. He gestured to two monumental statues of horses that were rearing out of the ground. They had to be at least thirty metres tall. They were lit by red lights that shone from inside them, casting a glow that could be seen as either malevolent or festive, depending on your interpretation. I chose the latter. Wow! They're amazing! What do you know about Kelpies? He asked. A whole lot of nothing, I admitted. They're more of a Scottish thing. Kelpies are said to haunt rivers and streams, usually in the shape of a horse. Their name comes from Gaelic, Kolpach or Kelpich, meaning colt or heifer. They're beautiful. As with a lot of beauty, it comes with a hidden edge. Kelpies look stunning, but they are said to be murderous in intent. Are they real? The majority of other realmers would say that they're not. But you'd say otherwise. They're rare. Rarer than unicorns. And it's a good thing, too, because they're deadly little buggers. Beautiful, though. One nearly killed me once. A Kelpie nearly killed a dragon? I asked in surprise. As I said, deadly little buggers. We walked towards the gargantuan statues. The park was deserted. I guess Emery had arranged for us to have the whole place to ourselves. Is it closed? I asked. To the common realm, yes. At this time of night, proximity runes help keep away anyone from the common. Why? So the other realm can come out to play, he said mischievously. Come on, I'll show you one of the other realm wonders. Gatto wasted no time in starting to gallivant around, galloping, paws flying, and tongue lolling. He looked like he was living his best life. He'd momentarily forgotten he was supposed to be on security detail, and I didn't remind him. He was having fun. Emery took my hand and laced his fingers through mine. I was struggling to squash a smile that wanted to burst out. My butterflies were raging now in the best way. We still had chemistry, thank God. Emery took us to the Kelpie statue on the left. A door swung open and I struggled to contain my gape when a wall of warmth hit me. Inside the Kelpie head were various mezzanine levels, and on each floor were tables. Music was blaring out. It was a restaurant and bar. All around us, the other community were meeting friends and family and going on dates. The whole place was decorated with tinsel, and Christmas trees were dotted about elegantly, giving a festive air. This is amazing! It's a pop-up bar and restaurant. It's only here for a couple of weeks. They do it every year, and it's virtually impossible to get a table. Did you have to grease some palms? I asked. Nope. I resorted to some good old-fashioned blackmail instead. He winked. True. Naughty dragon. I should have frowned that he finagled a table under less than honest means, but I found myself oddly flattered that he'd gone to so much trouble for me. Dotted around the bar were a number of trolls dressed in suits. It was clear that they were there to keep the place in order. Our own security was following us. I guess Emery didn't trust the trolls to do a good job. And I could see why backup was a good idea, because the restaurant was full of everything other, including vampires and a representative or two of the connection, albeit they looked like they were off duty. The vampires sneered at Emery, but didn't bother approaching whilst he had a visible entourage, or maybe it was his reputation alone that made them pause. The only brethren on our security team that I recognised was Tom Smith, Emery's right-hand man. I didn't know the rest. We were greeted by a voluptuous siren who showed us to a private table for two on the top floor. No mixing with the hoi polloi for Emery and me. Emery's security team spread out loosely across the top floor, leaving us a degree of privacy. Next to our table there was a dog bed for Gatto. Emery had thought of everything. On the back of our chairs hung two Christmas hats. Without batting an eyelid, 
The fashion-conscious billionaire fixed the red velvet creation with its white fur trim on his head. I booked us a tasty menu. I hope that's okay. I pulled on my Christmas hat. Something about Emery in the hat had short-circuited my brain. All I could think about was that I absolutely wanted to be a ho-ho-ho. I hoped I wasn't drooling visibly. The taster menu comes with a wine flight, but drink as much or as little as you like. Emery reassured me, flashing me a 200-watt smile. Sure, I agreed cluelessly as I tried to get my brain working again. The hat is distracting. You look like a gift-wrapped present. He grinned. I'm taking the hat home as a souvenir, then. I tried to get the conversation back on track. What's a wine flight? The restaurant picks a wine with each course to complement the food. I don't know much wine, I admitted. You're like a fine glass of red. I give you a bit of a hangover. He laughed aloud. No, you should be savoured. At room temperature. He chuckled. Actually, red wine should still be a little chilled. It used to be served at room temperature back in the days when there were castle cellars. Most red should still be served on a bucket of ice. Huh. You're a fount of knowledge. Mostly useless. I very much doubt that. His smile disappeared, and he leaned towards me earnestly. Actually, I have some knowledge to share with you. I wasn't sure when to tell you, but I found something that might help Lucy. Don't get your hopes up, it's a last resort. He raised a hand towards Tom, who stepped forward with the book in his hands. Page 108, Emery said as he passed it to me. The book was heavy, bound in leather, and looked old, like it should be in a museum, old. Excitement and trepidation were warring in my stomach. Excitement because the book held something that might help Lucy. Trepidation because Emery was saying it was a last resort. It didn't sound like the solution he was offering would be filled with kittens and flowers. And I really wanted a kittens and flowers solution. I carefully leafed through the book until I reached page 108. The handwriting was florid, ornate. It was difficult to read, so I pored over it several times until I was certain I had gleaned its meaning correctly. My stomach lurched. Emery was handing me a long shot. It was better than nothing, but not by much. I closed the book and pushed it back across the table. I didn't need to take a picture of its contents because I wouldn't be able to forget them if I tried. Tom stepped forward, picked it up and pushed it into a velvet-lined book bag. He was wearing white cotton gloves to avoid damaging it. This book was definitely a big deal. Thanks, I said to Emery. It's not a solution, he admitted, but it's something. It's a chance, I agreed, but I'll keep looking for something else until I don't have any choice. I forced a smile onto my face. I really appreciate you going to so much effort. You didn't get that book from a local bookstore. No, I, I didn't. Emery nodded at Tom, and the security team peeled away with Tom at its centre. I suddenly realised that they weren't there to guard Emery. But the book. I thought the security was here for you, I confessed. Emery laughed. No, I'm dangerous enough all by myself. Luckily for you, I laugh in the face of danger. I've noticed. It's one of the things I admire about you. He reached across the table and took my hand. I admire a great deal about you. You know, sometimes when you speak, you sound like you're from the 18th century. He looked amused. That's partly because I was raised in the 18th century, I suppose. Wow, you're really old, I teased. Do let me know your skincare regime. I moisturize, he admitted. I'm a modern man these days. Better to ride the wave of change than to resist it. Adapting all the time must be a challenge. Life would be boring without a challenge. Our conversation lulled as the next course arrived. Gatto was handed a dish of cooked sausages, whilst our delicate plates were laid in front of us. The waiter explained that the dish was beetroot prepared in five different ways. I did my best not to look too dubious, but beetroot wasn't really my thing. He poured a small glass of wine to accompany the food and left us to it. I'm not really a beetroot person. I looked enviously at the platter of sausages that Gatto was eagerly consuming so hastily that he was barely pausing to chew. It's pretty rare for me to eat a vegetarian dish, Emery said, but this place has rave reviews, so let's roll with it. I'm game. I prodded the food dubiously before diving in. It was heavenly. Oh my God, that's delicious. Emery tucked in, emerald eyes flashing with pleasure. Who knew I liked beetroot? The chef, apparently. That was the end of our scepticism. We ate everything that was brought to us with gusto. By the end of the nine-course meal, we were pleasantly full, and 
I was a little tipsy. Emery checked his watch. We'd better go, it's nearly midnight. If you turn into a pauper at the stroke of midnight, I'm still game. He flashed me a grin. I'm glad you like more about me than my bank account, but no, we have to go or we'll miss the next part of our evening. They go back into hiding later at night. They? He winked and said nothing. The next part, I tried instead. The night is still young. I've been up since 4am, so for me, the night was old and crone-like, but I couldn't bring myself to say so. It was the best date I'd ever been on. Admittedly, that wasn't saying much, as I'd only been on a handful of dates in my entire life, but it felt special to me. The night was magical, literally and figuratively. And apparently, it wasn't over yet. Chapter 10 we left the Kelby statues and started across the parkland towards the helicopter. There was no trace of the excitable puppy that Gatto had been as we arrived. He was plodding slowly and sedately, belly full and mind contented. An icy wind blew across the flatland, making me shiver. I was grateful for the jeans that I was wearing rather than a dress, but I really should have grabbed a jacket. Emery noticed my shiver and, without a word, shrugged off his suit jacket and wrapped it around my shoulders. It was warm and cosy and smelled like him. Yum. He kept one hand resting lightly on my hip and we walked with his arm wrapped around me. When we got to the helicopter, he pulled open the door and helped me in. I didn't need the help, but I appreciated the gesture. Gatto hopped in too. Emery said the door shut and Chris fired up the engines. Where are we going? I asked. It's a surprise. You and your surprises. Don't you like them? He asked, suddenly looking a little nervous. I love them. I confessed, thinking of Scott and his love of surprises. Good. Emery entwined our fingers and gently brushed his thumb across the back of my hand. Look at the view. My eyes had long since adjusted to the darkness around me. Scotland was indeed bonny. Oh, it's beautiful. It is. He agreed, but he was looking at me. I fought a blush, feeling flattered and awkward at the same time. Suddenly, the helicopter started to descend. Where are we going? I asked again. You know the answer by now, he said with amusement. It's a surprise, I parroted, rolling my eyes. He grinned. You're getting it. Chris set the bird down and we all climbed out. Emery looked dubiously at my boots and offered a steadying arm. I took it because it was a nice excuse to cuddle into him, but truthfully, I could have run down criminals in those boots. They only had a kitten heel. He didn't need to know that, though. Gatto romped ahead, happy to be on flat earth again. We walked along a tarmac path, but soon it dwindled into some sort of sheep trail. Emery looked dubiously at my boots again. Maybe this was a bad idea. I gave him a friendly shove. Don't be ridiculous, this is fine. Come on, I want to see what you've got for the grand finale. As we trudged on through the undergrowth and mud, I gave a mental apology to whoever had lent me their boots. I'd need to get this pair cleaned by a specialist. Emery whistled Gatto back to us. Stay close now, boy, he instructed. We need to be quiet from here. I mimed zipping my lips shut and throwing away the key. It turned out I really did love the cloak and dagger stuff. Emery was looking nervous. Wherever we were going was obviously a little dangerous. Adrenaline started to surge through me. We'd only spent a few days together, but he already knew me pretty well. Food and adventure. I was sold. We crept forward silently across the uneven terrain. Ahead were some boulders, and we slunk up behind them. Gatto was in full incognito mode, prowling close to the earth, silent and deadly. He was ready for action, all traces of his easy-going nature gone. I was ready too, my heart hammering in anticipation. I had no idea what we were about to witness, but I was excited about it. Emery held out his hand, in the universal gesture for us to stay, then skulked forward alone. A moment later he scrambled back, and waved to indicate that we should follow him. The moon was high, which helped illuminate the barren land around us. As I peered over the boulders, I had no trouble seeing the creatures below. Kelpies. Real ones. I held my breath as I watched the translucent creatures frolic in the river below. They were small. Smaller than I would have expected. More like foals than horses. Two of them were playing together, prancing back and forth and splashing in the water, bowing to each other and then jumping. They looked utterly adorable and as far removed from danger as you could get. 
Gatto evidently thought the same because he crept towards them. I nudged Emery in the ribs and pointed to Gatto. Was that a problem? The Kelpies paused in their play at Emery's muttered oath, their heads twisting unknowingly to our position behind the boulders. They started to come towards us and Gatto. Our incognito mode was shot. Gatto! I shouted. Come back! Now! Emery grabbed my hand, tugging me to my feet and starting to run. Back to the helicopter! Now! Gatto! I shouted again. Finally, I seemed to get through to him. He blinked once and shook his head before starting to trot back to us. Faster! Emery yelled at him. And then we were all running. The two Kelpies threw back their heads and neighed. But it wasn't the nice whinny of a horse or a unicorn. This was a discordant sound, like fingernails on a blackboard that made me wince. There was an answering noise, louder and terrifyingly close. We all put on extra speed, running flat out on the uneven and dangerous terrain. I was glad I'd picked kitten heels. Finally, we were on the tarmac path again, and I risked a glance back. A huge, watery horse was pounding after us. It was taller than any horse I'd ever seen. Bigger than twenty hands, at least. Screw hands, that bad boy should have been measured in arms. He, or she, I wasn't stopping to look at its sex, was stocky. It's solid, corded muscle, like a shire horse on steroids. If I had to guess, I'd say the two cuties frolicking in the water were its babies, and we'd come far too close to its territory. Emery pulled out his phone as he ran and speed dialed Chris. Get ready for an emergency evac, he shouted. Be ready to lift off in thirty seconds. Emery could shift into dragon form, at least he'd be okay. And maybe he could fly me or Gatto to safety, but not both of us. Leaving Gatto behind wasn't an option. I had no idea what would happen to me if the Kelpie caught up with us. Would I get stampeded to death or drowned? Life's mysteries could be a lot of fun. I don't know why I looked back, because it was a stupid thing to do. I could almost feel the Kelpie's fishy breath behind me. It was close, but not as close as the thundering sounds had made it seem. We had a chance. All traces of inebriation and tipsiness had gone. My heart was pounding and my limbs were surging forward. I'd never felt so alive. We broke through the undergrowth into the clearing where the helicopter was waiting. Its rotary blades swung overhead, already fiercely whirring, ready to take off. Emery dived in first and turned to pull me after him, but I was close on his heels and I needed no help. We were being chased by a demon horse. Gatto had been bringing up the rear, checking on me, making sure I was safe. When I was in the helicopter, he wasted no time in leaving in after us. Chris took off without waiting for us to secure the doors, and we lurched into the air with no finesse and a great deal of speed. The huge Kelpie was still pounding towards us. It reared up high on its back legs, trying to get one last desperate bite at us. It missed, and I expelled a breath that I hadn't been aware I was holding. Safe now, my heart started to slow, as I sat on the seat next to Emery. I grinned at him. You're brilliant at organising dates. He laughed a little at first, but then descended into full-blown guffaws. I had planned a romantic moonlight gaze at some mystical Kelpies, not a midnight life and death chase, he said finally, when he'd calmed down. Nothing like a little life and death chase to make you appreciate you're alive. Danger is the spice of life. I don't think that's a saying, I said ruefully. Close enough. He leaned forward. All traces of laughter gone. I am finding myself very appreciative. Of what? Of the fine company I'm keeping. You're beautiful. I smiled awkwardly. I wasn't the best at receiving compliments. It's all the running probably put some colour into my cheeks. And some sweat under my armpits. He was dangerously close. Had I put on perfume? I should have put on perfume. Emery had that look in his eye. A look that I had seen once before. Last time it had been followed by the best kiss of my life. The butterflies in my stomach roared into life and my blood ran hot. He leaned in nice and slowly, giving me plenty of time to move away, but I leaned in instead. My eyes stood closed as his lips touched mine. Our last kiss had been long and slow, tantalizing and teasing. But this one was hot and passionate. Both of our engines were fired after our brush with death. Somehow I was on his lap. We were a tangle of limbs, and if Gatto and Chris hadn't been there, buttons would have been popping. But they were, and that thought cooled my ardour. With real effort, I pulled back. Emery was smiling at me, his eyes smoky and hot. He leaned in for one last possessive swipe of his lips. Oh yes, we still had chemistry. Enough to fuel a nuclear plant. 
He lifted me effortlessly and placed me on the seat next to him again, giving us a little distance so we could cool down. Neither of us wanted to rush this, whatever it was. I searched for some small talk, but my mind was strangely blank. Where will you spend Christmas? I asked. I'll probably be working, but I'll spend some time with family. You? Well, these days I usually spend it with Lucy's family. He nodded, his eyes somber. Thank you for showing me the book. It looked ancient. You didn't check that out of any library. Not in the usual way, that's for sure, he admitted ruefully. Did you steal it? The men will put it back. I doubt the owner knew it was missing. No harm, no foul. Thank you for going to so much effort for me. I found that there isn't much I wouldn't do for you, Jessica Sharp. Well, that sentiment deserved a kiss. I rewarded him appropriately, loving the feel of his lips curving into a smile against mine. I feel like I should have got you more than bacon, I declared. You've given me the most romantic night. Most people wouldn't call what we just had romantic, he laughed. Good thing I'm not most people. For me, it was perfect. And all I gave you was bacon. Really good bacon. I loved it. Thank you. Next year, I'm going to give you something epic. I promised. His green eyes flashed with warmth. Now that's the best gift you could have given me. What? A promise for next year. He murmured. He leaned in for another kiss. I guess it was his turn to reward me for good behaviour. I'd had the best date of my life. I had a potential option for saving Lucy. And I had the hottest man on the planet kissing me. I couldn't help but feel that this year, Christmas, had come early. This has been Glimmer of Christmas, written by Heather Harris, narrated by Elise Gibbs.